of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, Amen. where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name Amen. written on it, known only to him who receives it. Amen. Amen. Remember back in chapter 1, he gave us a description of this almighty, all-powerful God. And remember he said, I heard a voice. And I turned around to look where this voice was coming from and who was talking. And there he said, I beheld one that was dressed in a robe all the way down to his feet. This is the same one, he said, that had hair like wool and white as snow. This is the one whose feet were bronze and his eyes were as a fire and out of his mouth came a double-edged sword. Now when it gets to the church of Pergamum, John says to them, this same God who has eyes as though they're flames of fire, and out of his mouth comes this double-edged sword. This is the God that is watching over you as you live in the midst of the city where Satan's throne is. I don't know how many of you would like to live in the city where Satan's throne is. I'm going to let you know today that we probably are living in that city Amen. even as we sit here. Amen. We'd like to write, write it off. We would like to put it back there, you know, aeons ago. But Satan is always on the move. He's always shifting the scenes. He's always advancing his cause. Jesus took the disciples 
on a journey. He took them way up in northern Israel to the, to the head of the Jordan River. And there, out of the mountains and out of a great big cave, every spring there would be this great runoff and the entire mouth of the cave would gush forth water and it would fill up the reservoir as it were and that became the headwaters and the source for the Jordan River. Uniquely, though it became the headwaters for the Jordan River, it also was a place of tremendous idol worship. And there the pagans had built their temples to their idols and to their gods and their demonic worship. And here it was called the gates of hell. And remember Jesus went up there and to the disciples he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Amen? And as he said that, they were sitting right there that the whole world called the gates of hell. They knew that there was the center of idolatry in Israel and really for much of the then known world. It was right there, the gates of hell. And Jesus went right up there with his 12 disciples and he made this great announcement, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now just fast forward 150 years and we come to the city called Pergamon and this city, according to the Holy Spirit, was where Satan had his throne. And I think, isn't God amazing? He had his disciples march right through the gates of hell, <laughs> right up to where Satan had his throne, and they built with God a church. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I say that to say this, God's not afraid of the devil. Amen. And if God's not afraid of the devil, you shouldn't be afraid of the Amen. devil either. Amen. One thing to respect them. It's one thing to know your enemy, but you don't have to be afraid of them. And God sent his disciples, disciples that were willing to die for their faith. The bishop, Antipas, gave his life up because he refused to bow his knee to this demonic worship and to these idols. They were there right where Satan had his throne. And they were worshiping God and building the church and souls were being saved. Hallelujah. Don't have a panic attack just because there's some darkness on the horizon. Don't throw your hands up in frustration just because you find that there's a lot of pressures being thrown at the church right now or maybe thrown at your own personal life. Just dig your toes in and realize that God is God of everything, that he is still the sovereign Lord, and he's not afraid of the devil, and he will take people like you and me, little ordinary disciples, and he will tell us to go right down through the gates of hell, and we'll build a church right there in Pergamon, where the throne of Satan is. The throne of Satan was where the demonic forces literally came to get their instructions and take directions from the devil. The throne of Satan is where evil emanated and where the forces of darkness went out from. But the church of Pergamum was growing right there under the devil's nose. Come on, church. Right there, right by Satan's throne, the church of Jesus Christ was growing. You see, sometimes we think that we just want Jesus to get us out of the hard places. But if you read the scripture, you'll find out that he won't get us out of the hard places. He'll keep us in the hard places. He'll take us through the hard places. He will help us grow in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficult situations. Even though the devil is all around us and he's making good look like it's evil and he's making evil look like it's good. 
we'll discover that God is still there. And even though he's trying to tempt us, and even though he's trying to defeat us, and even though he's trying to deceive us, we can still stand there and we can grow in the anointing and grow in our lives. Right now we're looking and watching the news and we see, you know, the Ukraine being ravaged and bombed and shelled. But we see a leader there, rather interesting individual. <laughs> he used to be a comedian. Somehow he became the president. <laughs> well, they claim he was elected. <laughs> they said it was by a democratic vote. And so this comedian becomes the elected president. The United States government phoned him the other day and they said, um, we can get you out of the Ukraine. We can fly you and your family out to safety. And Zelensky said, I don't need a ride. I need weapons. <laughs> and the whole country rallied around that. And now they've got a comedian that who is their president who's willing to stand and fight and take up arms himself, even walking around, you know, during the, the, the barrage. And I haven't watched the news today, so I don't know what happened last night or whatever, but, you know, it's just an ins inspiration to the world and to the whole European uh, continent. And they're looking up and they're saying, oh, my goodness, here's one man that's willing to face down death Amen. because he loves his country. How much more should you and I be willing to face down death because we know that our citizenship is in heaven. Yes, sir. We know that Jesus is our Lord. We know that Jesus is our God. Amen. And so this was the kind of city that they lived in. And the Bible says that they were doing such a good job. Remember, it says that they didn't renounce their faith. They didn't cave. They didn't give in. Even though there was such pressure on them, they didn't give in. And then we hear this word that we didn't want to hear. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. They were doing so good. They were fighting so hard. But there was an issue that crept into the church. There was compromise. The church lowered its standard. The church became weary in well-doing. It's time for you and I to take note. It's time for you and I to sit up straight and say, if they could do it, maybe we could do it. You see, living in a sinful atmosphere, sitting, you know, in a city, living in a city where Satan's throne is can have a wearing effect on you. Let's just rehearse for a second. Lot held on to his righteousness but compromised his character. King David loved God with all of his heart but he succumbed to the lust of the flesh. Jonah wanted to be a great preacher and a missionary but only to those that he deemed worthy. Abraham was moving in faith. The Bible says that he was the father of our faith, but because of fear, he lied about his wife. Samson knew that he was a deliverer to set Israel and the people of God free, but he let the lust of the eyes lead him into sin. The church of Pergamon was holding fast. They were walking the walk, but over time they became assimilated into the culture. And they allowed those that held to the teaching of Balaam to stay in the church. They allowed those that followed the Nicolaitan doctrine to stay in the church. See, we live in a situation just like Israel, just like the church of Pergamon. We're being bombarded and we're being surrounded by worldly pressures all the time. When Balak hired Balaam to come and curse Israel, Balaam couldn't do it. 
Because those that God has blessed, God has blessed, and those that have been cursed have been cursed. And the reason why Balak wanted Israel to be cursed was because he was so afraid of them because they were defeating every king and every country that they came in contact with. And he knew that his only way out was to somehow get them to be cursed and he could stop it that way because his army wasn't going to defeat them. So he hired Balaam. Now, if you go back and you read about this particular situation and what happened, he offered Balaam money and gold and silver and fortune and fame. And Balaam took the bait and he thought, well, maybe I can go down and I can just say something because I can use a few extra bucks in my bank account. But when he got down to that particular country that Balak was the king over, and he went up to the high place and he was going to curse Israel, all God gave him was a blessing. And he would end up pronouncing a blessing on Israel. And Balak would get so angry. And Balaam said, I can only say what God gives me. And then Balak would take Balaam to another place in the country and he would offer some more sacrifices to his demonic gods and then he would say to Balaam, all right, now go ahead and curse Israel. And Balaam again would stand up and he would try to curse Israel, but all God would give him was another blessing. And Balak was pulling his hair out. He was so frustrated. And they did this about four different times. And finally, at the end, Balaam said, I can't curse those that God has blessed. I can only bless them. And Balak said, you've got to do something. You've got to do something. And Balaam said, well, I can't curse them, but I can tell you what to do so that they will come under a curse. Now listen careful, church. This is extremely important. He said, if you would cause them to compromise, send the young women in to seduce them and lead them astray morally, and then get them to come and bow down to their idols and worship. He said, then they will fall under the curse of God. And so Balak went back to his people, and he sent in the young women to seduce the men of Israel. He sent them in to get them to compromise and to lower their standards and to end up sinning against God and becoming immoral. And then they would follow the women to their demonic idols and they would kneel down and they would eat the food. And this is what the Bible says here, that they ate the food offered to idols and they fell into sexual immorality. And the church of Pergamon, even though they were victorious in many ways and they were not willing to deny their faith and they were willing to be martyrs for their faith, yet they were compromising on their lifestyle and issues that God said there's no room to compromise on. And today the church has compromised. The church has found ways to justify immorality. Listen to me, church. Listen. Some people call it hate speech when we preach against sin. When we have a godly opinion, when we read the scripture the way that is written, when we challenge the world's lifestyle, this church lived where Satan's throne was. I'm not so sure that this church doesn't live where Satan's throne is. See, the problem wasn't that the church was in Pergamon. The problem was that Pergamon was in the church. You understand what I'm saying? We can't always make a difference. We can't always make a choice as to where we live. We're here. We're in Edmonton. Like it or lump it. This is where we live. But there's nothing in the scripture that says that we have to let Edmonton get into our hearts. See, when you pull back, when somebody asks you about hell, 
and you just downplay it. When you say Jesus is my way, but you don't take a stand and say he is the way. When it's easier to be quiet than stand up and take a stand, then Pergamon has gotten into your life. No one wants to be marginalized. None of us want to be canceled. We all want to be relevant in our own circle. And I'm here to tell you today, church, it's not going to be easy. It's going to require the Spirit of God and he who has a double-edged sword in his mouth, piercing and dividing between truth and error, that is going to have to be living in you as well so that you can rise up and take a stand and you can be, tr you can be true and you can be loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem is when Christians try to live in both worlds at once, where there is too much of Pergamon in the church. And if God called Pergamon and the church of Pergamon to a place of repentance, what is God calling you and me to? This is a practical word yes. from the word of God. Amen. God was getting them ready for the tribulation. Yes. The word of God was trying to help them understand it's going to get worse before it gets better. The Holy Spirit was trying to shake them up and say, come on, church. You think you've got it tough now. We live in a lap of luxury. Amen. We live in a pretty cozy situation. And it doesn't take much to shake the church of North America up. And I'm praying that the church will become shaken to its core. Judgment must begin at the house of the Lord. Well, it's time for us to repent. That's the bottom line, church. But God being God doesn't leave us there. He calls us to repentance and then he says, I just want to give you a little bit of encouragement. He said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him who overcomes. If he says to him who overcomes, that means there's going to be somebody that can overcome. Do I have anybody here this morning that wants to be an overcomer? Come on, wave it high, wave it proud, look around and say, I'm going to help you to be an overcomer. I'll kick you in the back side if I have to, but I'm going to help you to be an overcomer. Hallelujah. That's the promise. To him that hears, let him hear. And to him that overcomes, I will give of the hidden manna. The hidden manna. I believe that God wants to give you hidden manna this morning and this afternoon and tomorrow. Jesus said, I give you peace that the world can't give you. I give you a peace that is beyond comprehension and beyond the world's understanding. That's what I call hidden manna. Yes. He says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And he said, my father and I are going to come and we're going to abide. We're going to live in you. That's the hidden manna. What helps us keep true? What helps us to stay strong? It's knowing that Jesus Christ lives within me. You can kill the body, but you can't kill the spirit. Amen. You can destroy the outer man. You can break it and beat it, but you can't kill the spirit. And the hidden manna that you and I get to partake of, if we'll just be overcomers, is to know that Jesus Christ is sitting right here on the throne of my heart. Hallelujah. The hidden manna is knowing that I'm a son of the Most High God. Amen. 
The hidden manna is knowing that I'm ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. The hidden manna is knowing that my citizenship is in heaven. I may be Canadian, but I want you to know beyond being a Canadian, I am a citizen of heaven. Hallelujah. I'm partaking of the hidden manna. I don't have to wait for eternity. I don't have to wait for tomorrow. I can feast on the hidden manna today. The manna was something that God gave, but you had to go and pick it up. Amen. The manna was something that God gave, but he didn't make it last forever. He had to give you new manna every day of the week. In other words, church, if you're going to be an overcomer, you've got to partake of the hidden manna on a daily basis. You've got to eat it morning, noon, and night. You've got to digest it. You've got to let that hidden manna become your inner strength. Hallelujah. And your source of knowledge. Then he went on and he said, not only will I give him some of the hidden manna, but I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it. Think of it, church. A white stone with a new name written on it. Only known to him who receives it. There was a unique thing that happened in the Roman Empire. And it was when the emperor was having a great festival and it was by invitation only. He would take a small piece of white marble and he would have his craftsmen engrave your name on this small piece of white marble. And when the festival or the feast was about to happen, you would go and you would present yourself and you would show them your white marble with your name engraved on it. A little bit like the infamous QR code. Tongue in cheek. You couldn't get into the festival if you didn't have the white stone with your name written on it. I want you to know something, church. You're not going to get into heaven unless you've got a white stone with a name written on it that nobody knows except the one who has received the stone. Amen. I think it might be the name of Jesus because he's paid the ultimate price. I think it might be the name of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings because that's indeed who he is. Don't write my name on the white stone because I failed. Don't write your name on the stone because you've stumbled. But write a name on there that will be recognized in the heavenly courts and it will give me a pass to come before the King of Kings. That will give me a pass to come and bow down at the throne and worship Jesus. And so to him that overcomes, you'll be able to partake of the hidden manna and you'll receive a white stone with a name written on it that only he who receives it will know. Have you picked up your white stone yet? Have you secured your pass into heaven? Have you got a one-way ticket? Have you got the pass? Or are you living such compromised are you living so close to the edge that if you were to be captured and judged for being a Christian, there might not be enough evidence to convict you? We're living in a city where Satan's throne is. But you don't have to die there. Quick question for you. Have you got the white stone? Is your name, not your name, but the name of Jesus written on your stone? Do you know that your ability to get into heaven rests on Jesus and Jesus alone? Amen. If you can't lift your hand and say, yes, I got the white stone and I'm sure the name of Jesus is written on that stone. This is going to be your day. This is going to be your opportunity. In Jesus' name. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I, recognize I recognize today that by accepting your love, 
by acknowledging your shed blood that you can forgive me. I'm asking you for the white stone today with your name written on it that'll give me a pass into heaven. Help me to not compromise, but to be pure and to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you've got some friends. You all have friends that are living on the brink of hell. Is that right? Do you have a love for them? Are you concerned about their eternal destiny? Do you want them to have what you have? Do you want them to get excited when we worship? To have a God who answers their prayers? Then it's up to you to tell them. It's up to you to invite them. It's up to you to start sharing with them. Don't compromise the next time somebody says, what do you think about miracles? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? I think so-and-so should go straight to hell. And maybe that would be your clue to get in there and talk about the fact that that's the eternal destiny for everybody that doesn't acknowledge Jesus. Take it to your advantage. Don't be shy. And go and be a nuisance to the devil. Amen? Amen. In Jesus' name.